This is the first in our series examining Nordic, uh, the Nordic model, and uh, in particular aspects of individual Nordic societies. These are remarkable countries. Uh, they have high they're characterized by high levels of trust, uh, considerable gender and economic equality, and they regularly are listed among the happiest countries in the world. And with regard to Finland, it is often cited for its educational system. Um, it's consistently listed as one of the best or the best educational system. But wait, how could that possibly be? Their children start at seven years old. They have almost no homework, rare stand standardized tests, uh, 15 uh, minutes of play for every hour of instruction. This, this can't be possible. <laughs> well, it is. And we have, as uh, Ed mentioned, <clears throat> two outstanding uh, experts in the area uh, who can help us explain uh, this remarkable educational system. Linda Lucas is the author and illustrator of Hello Ruby, a children's picture book about the whimsical world of computers as well as the founder of Rails Girls, a global movement to teach young women programming in over 270 cities. This is my absolute favorite introduction line that I've ever said for anybody. Her TED talk has gathered over 1.5 million viewers. I just think that's remarkable. Uh, she is a product of the Finnish educational system, and she has studied business design and engineering at Aalto University and product engineering from Stanford University. Please welcome Linda and Linda Pugh. Our other panelist is Sam Abrams. <coughs> Sam is the director of national, the National Center for Study of Privatization and Education at Teachers College, Columbia University, and the author of many books and articles on education. He was previously a high school teacher of economics and history for 18 years. Um, and for his efforts to promote an understanding of Finnish education, the Finnish government in 2014 made him a knight first class order of the Lion of Finland. That's a pretty good line too, I have to say. <laughs> uh, he is an American, but born in Athens, Greece, um, raised in Holyoke, Massachusetts. He earned his BA, MA, and PhD from Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Sam. I'll take the So um, I will join our, our panelists uh, for a conversation, uh, starting with a few questions. Later in the program, we'd like your questions. If there are things you hear, um, we'd, we'd like uh, this is the time to ask the people who actually might know. So, I guess the first question. The first question is something along the lines of how did this happen? As I understand it, if we went to the middle of the 20th century, the Finnish education was not system was not particularly distinguished, and there was kind of a national effort or a national decision to change that and to make it much better. Can you give us some thoughts on how that happened and what happened? So first of all, I think we should acknowledge that Finland is a tiny, tiny country, five million people, and a young country also, only a little bit over a hundred years. And in the mid fifties and sixties, and you'll know the exact dates and stories, I'll just paint the big picture. We realized that for a country this small, there's no way to globally compete unless we lift everyone equally up. And that's when the first big school reform was done. So the Finnish society is built on equity, education, and from my perspective as a children's book author who writes about technology, also I think a strong sense and idea around engineering and technology, and it has done wonders for us, which like the, the whole educational um, like uh, success we've seen in the past years, the uh, equity and, and uh, those things, and, and then also uh, in more recent years, the, the growth that the tech sector through Nokia first and then later through uh, smaller uh, companies like Supercell and, and Rovio have done have kind of like made us into a poster child of, of a lot of the, 
the nations that are happening right now. And I think the big secret is that we didn't know that this was the case. For 20 odd years, uh, we had no idea that we are the best schooling system in the world. And actually from a very kind of, my perspective, I was in the lower secondary school around the time when the first PISA study started to happen. And I did my first standardized testing, believe it or not, at the age of 15. That was the first time I did any standardized testing in my school career. And this was also the time when Finland started to like really top the PISA studies. And it was a total surprise for all of us, because we had no idea that we had created something so special. Well, uh, Steve, I think uh, Linda hit the nail on the head in talking about uh, essentially the economic necessity. Uh, that if Finland uh, was going to join the modern world, it had to focus on the development of its human capital. Um, a member of parliament uh, named Matti Sarden, a social democrat from Lochia, told me um, several years ago, we have our timber and we have our brains. That is all. <laughs> So there is the economic necessity. And on top of that, there is the nation building. Um, Linda pointed out that Finland's a young country, born in 1917, um, and a poor country. Uh, and way behind Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. For example, in terms of education, compulsory education was introduced in um, Denmark in uh, 1814, uh, and then followed by uh, Norway in 1829, Sweden in 1842. Finland doesn't introduce compulsory education until 1921, wow. okay? Second, in the 1930s, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden had strong uh, social uh, security systems. Finland didn't have anything but workers, accident, insurance until 1963, okay? Uh, in terms of GDP per capita, Finland in comparison to Sweden in 1950, 63%, okay? So far behind. Moreover, a lot of people don't know this about Finland. Shortly after the Declaration of Independence in 1917, there was a horrible civil war. It lasted three months. 37,000 people were killed, okay? You're talking about a country of under four million people. Uh, that's a significant percentage of the population. People still today in Finland identify as red or white, okay? Then World War II comes. And today, by the way, in that regard, uh, marks an important uh, day in Finnish history, March 13th. It's the close of the Winter War. Uh, the Soviets attacked November 30th, 1939. The feeling at that time was that Finland would last one month, okay? Because of Finnish Sisu, and people probably know that word. If you don't, it means determination, blind determination. Um, Finland lasted three months and two weeks. March 13th, okay, of 1940, closed that war. But the war continued. There was the continuation war against the Soviets. And then war with the Germans after uh, Mannerheim refused to uh, sign a uh, combined pe uh, peace. Uh, and 90,000 Finns, died in that war, they lost 10% of their territory, 12% of the population, 450,000 people had to be resettled, and Finland had to pay reparations to the Soviets until 1952. So you, you had an economic necessity, and you had a need to build a nation. But the only reason we're talking about Finland right now is because of what Linda identified, the PISA results. PISA is an acronym for the Program for International Student Assessment. It's an exam given by the OECD only as far back as 2000, every three years, to a sample of approximately 6,015 year olds in each member nation of the organization of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Nobody expected Finland to do so well. And it did, it did very well again in 2003, 2006, 2009, 2012. And I'll, uh, I don't wanna feed you too much data, but I'll, I'll just close with this, Steve, in this regard because people criticize me for citing Finland as something that we should copy, as a country we should copy, because they say Finland is small, it's egalitarian, it's homogeneous. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and least small, egalitarian, homogeneous. In terms of the Gini coefficient, the measure for income inequality, they're all about the same, okay? In terms of homogeneity, pretty close. Okay, Denmark and, and, and uh, Sweden are more heterogeneous in particular cities. Okay, 
but in general, very close. But if we take a look at these PISA results that Linda mentioned, all right, uh, and I did this uh, in a book I wrote about this, um, and I only wrote one book, by the way, not many books, one book. <laughs> many articles. Uh, articles, yes, not books. Uh, if, if you take a look at the results for this exam and compare Finland, okay, to Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, you'll see something astounding, okay? So let's just take a look at science in particular, which I think is the most telling subject. Because unless your mother is a physicist, you're not doing science experiments in the kitchen, okay? That happens at school, okay? So the school effect is probably most pronounced in science results. And I spent time in science labs and schools in Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Iceland, okay? The mean score is a 500. 100 points up is a standard deviation. So they'll take you from the 50th percentile to the 84th percentile and down to 400 from the 50th to the 16th. All right? If you take a look at those five administrations of the exam, 2000, 2003, 2006, 2009, 2012, five administrations, for Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, combine them as one country, their composite score was a 494. Okay, just below the mean. The United States, by the way, was a 496. People love to dump on American education. They're wrong to do it. We have great education in America, and we have bad education in America. Okay? And it typically correlates with poverty. Finland, a 550. That's why we're here tonight. Okay? And the way they measure how much years of learning Okay, that constitutes the number of points, is they give the same exam to a sample of 16-year-olds. And typically, 16-year-olds score 35 to 40 points better. So the Finns, on five administrations of this exam, okay, scored 56 points better than their Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish counterparts. That's about a year and a half more of learning. Okay, so in, to build on what Linda said, it's economic necessity and it's nation building. They had to do this to build themselves as a nation in, 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 the, in the face of the menacing Russian bear and uh, in the face of their own history uh, with the Civil War to come together and be one nation. Sam, thank you. I mean, you have all of us on the edge of the chair. <laughs> with what's the secret sauce? What makes that difference? Now, we've heard a lot about the professionalism, professionalism of the teacher corps, the training, the fact that you get some of the best and brightest uh, out of the universities to join the teacher corps. But Linda, what's your, your answer to what is the differentiation? Mm. I do think there's a lot in the way the teachers uh, are given autonomy over their own classrooms. Uh, I work here in New York quite a bit with the public school teachers and uh, I feel like oftentimes the frameworks and standards and, and uh, core curriculum points ground people. I'll just give you an example from the computer science curriculum. Um, in the computer science curriculum framework that has been proposed in New York, it's probably like 100 or 120 pages long and it details in like very exact uh, pinpoints like down like by the age of six kids should understand what an algorithm is and, and should be able to do this and this and this. The Finnish core curriculum can be fit into one PowerPoint slide. It says that by the age two kids should understand the basics of how to break down a problem. They should explore programming in an age-appropriate manner and, and they should uh, be, there's like a third point or something throughout whether it's like uh, physical education, whether it's arts and crafts, whether it's the math curriculum. And that's the guidance the teacher gets. And they themselves then implement uh, the curriculum in the way they see, see fit. We don't have like um, school investigations, anyone coming to like assess the teacher's jobs. Uh, there's a lot of autonomy over the classroom with the teacher. And then there's of course the culture that supports the teacher. My parents were really proud when they realized that their way more daughter or her who had done like a lot of different things ended up kind of being an educator and being a teacher is still one of the most respected jobs in our country. You, you said something there that I'm interested at. <clears throat> in. So we will have inspectors come around to schools or sit in classrooms while someone's trying to teach and the rest of it. Do I hear you saying that's not likely no. in the Finnish system? No, there's a lot of autonomy over the classroom and 
and the teachers aren't allowed themselves to divide, decide why, how and why they are teaching the curriculum. Um, I wonder if we could say a word or two about the school day. When does it start? When does it end? Is it longer than a U.S. school day? Well, it's a product of the system. Linda, you can address this in particular. I, mean, uh, I know the details, but you'll, you'll provide more color. Uh, I think one of the most sort of profound memories from my own childhood, having gone through this system. Well, first of all, everyone should know that there's uh, almost only public schools in Finland. There's very few private schools, and like the few private schools are probably like religious schools or so forth. So pretty much everyone goes through the same system. And um, the school days are short, typically from 8 to 2 o'clock or so, and there's very little after school activities or so forth. So Finnish children have a lot of autonomy themselves also. And uh, there's a lot of recess time throughout the day, and I do think that like uh, Finns love to talk about this thing called the phenomenon-based learning, which is in every other country, it's something like project-based learning or, or so forth. That's something that was very naturally done already in my elementary school years in the 90s when we had no idea that we had the best schooling system in the world. Uh, because some of my best memories from high school, uh, from elementary school are uh, the recess time when we would build forts in the, like, the forests and, and then like just expand those projects back into the classroom and explore how the joints we made out of wood were actually like early prototypes for our physics or, or so forth. So I, I do believe that there is this culture of a lot of play around uh, our education system and that is something that is kind of very, uh, defines it very well. Steve, if I may chime in about the secret sauce. Um, Linda talked about no inspections and also about uh, no standardized testing. So I imagine you sat for PISA. Yeah. Okay. And the first generation. I uh, know this. Yeah, first generation, 2000. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, this isn't rocket science. Okay. Um, as I said, I sat in on uh, science classes in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, as well as in, in schools across Finland over a number of years. Um, Apropos what Linda just said about phenomenon-based learning, only in Finland, okay, our science classes run essentially as labs, okay? They're doing labs all the time. You don't learn soccer by watching soccer, you learn soccer by playing soccer, and uh, you learn science by doing science. And uh, as far as uh, the teachers are concerned, so there's, I didn't see this in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, or Iceland, okay? That focus on labs, okay? Um, it's highly developed. So in terms of the curriculum, uh, Lynn is actually right. You could fit the curriculum on the <coughs> slide if you wanted to, um, but the teachers themselves are, um, they, they know the curriculum inside now because of a special five-year BAMA prep program, okay? And it's three years content, two years theory and practice, okay? And when do you Even for the elementary uh, and the early childhood teachers. Right, okay. So this is not true in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, or Iceland, where you have to have a master's degree. Okay, it's not true in the United States, except after five years in New York, Massachusetts, and I think Ohio. Um, uh, but that's after five years of teaching. In Finland, it's before you teach. Um, the third thing, uh, Linda mentioned autonomy. Um, I became interested in Finnish education from an article in a French magazine I read, The New Observer, The Novellops. This was back in uh, 2005, February 17th, to be specific. Uh, <coughs> And uh, this article clearly made an impression on me by a woman named Caroline Brizard, um, education reporter for the Novellops. She went up to Finland because she was astounded by how much better Finland had done than France, okay? And she said, geez, we always thought we had great schools and uh, the results from Finland are so much better than the French results. And she observed a couple of things, one of which Linda just identified. Autonomy of the teacher, okay? And autonomy of the school. In France, the principal doesn't even get to select her staff, okay? It comes from on high. And uh, the uh, textbooks can't be chosen uh, by the schools. All of that is done ground up in Finland, okay? Um, and in large part because the teachers have internalized the expectations of the system through this excellent prep. Um, and then, when I mentioned the play, the rule is every 45 minutes of instruction, 50 minutes of play. On top of that, so much art, music, crafts, and play. I, I studied the allocation of periods. If from grades one through nine, the student will have anywhere from four to 11 periods a week 
of art, music, crafts, play. All students in seventh grade, including boys, must take a semester of culinary arts. Okay? And what's wonderful about culinary arts and all these other things is there are easy ways into math and science, which Linda can speak to with much more expertise than I. But on top of that, they make school attractive. You want to go to school because a lot of this stuff is fun. So you have excellent teacher prep. You have uh, the labs. And by the way, they cap classes at 16 if they're using any kind of machinery that applies to science labs typically. So you will have no more than 16 students. So you can do these labs. Um, uh, th uh, the third thing is the well-rounded curriculum with lots of play. And uh, there, there, there's more to it than that. But the fourth, apropos Linda's mention of sitting for an exam when she was 15 years old, they don't do what we do here. And Denmark, Norway, and Sweden also have standardized tests. What the Finns do is they test every subject, okay? And that's from, Cullen, that's from Finnish and Swedish, the mother tongues, to culinary arts and music, okay? But only a tiny sample. And they do it over a 10-year period. And for mathematics, they take 6,000 third graders, they test them again in sixth grade, ninth grade, and 12th grade for a longitudinal sample of what's been accomplished, all right? But it's not high stakes. The kids don't get the results, the parents don't get the results, the teachers don't get the results, the principals get the results, okay? And then in ninth grade, they take a look at two subjects a year, 10% of the student body, all right? And they do 10% of the schools, they do cluster sampling, they don't do uh, entire sampling. But what we do here in the United States, by contrast, ever since No Child Left Behind uh, was uh, signed in 2002, we test all students in grades three through eight in English and math in one year in high school. That's terribly, it's not only terribly stressful and wasteful, it necessarily crowds out time for art, music, crafts, and play because all principals are pitted against each other to get their scores up. So what do they do? They will have less recess, we'll have less music. They even cut out history and science in a lot of schools because the currency of the school system uh, is math and reading school. And I would add, like, maybe a final point to the secret sauce. I have no idea how the standardized tests work in Finland, and that is the, like that my teacher didn't see the scores and, and so forth. And I think the beauty of the system right now is also that we get so much interest from the rest of the world. People from all over the world uh, come to Finland to visit me, who's not even a classroom teacher or a policymaker, and saying that, hey, like, we want to figure out the computing curriculum. Uh, here's what we are doing. Are we, like, left behind and say, oh, interesting. That's really cool what you're doing. You should talk with the Koreans, they are sure doing something interesting. And I think the entire Finnish educational system benefits from the fact that people are coming and asking for help, but also through the process sharing what they know so well, and we learn from them. And it's this dialogue of, of like being able to learn from others that is really, really beneficial for our country right now. Just to back up one step, what's the guiding philosophy that first created the system and continues to uh, energize the system? I mean, in the U.S., you might call it's like our old U.S. Army slogan: "Be all that you can be." We're, we're at the individual level very much. Is it? Give me a sense of what the guiding principle is behind first the changes and the way that system runs currently. In the best of ways, it's lift everyone equally up. No one gets left behind. We need to invest in everyone in a small country. But it also means that don't try to be more special than everyone else. So as a practical example, I loved history and social sciences in, in low, uh, lower secondary. And I was so active in classroom. And I did like a big essay on John F. Kennedy and like the moon landing and everything. And then I get like um, an A minus from my, my, my uh, final studies. And, and then uh, my mom does like a P uh, parent-teacher conference call with the teacher and, and they discuss this and, and she asks like, why didn't Linda get an A in her like, end results? Because she got an A minus and she was active in class and the teacher says, Linda tries too hard. <laughs> and that is the challenge of Finnish educational system on the opposite end that don't you try to be more special? And I think some can continue of the legacy of where this kind of idea that like lift everyone equally up, but don't try to be more special than the others come from. And that is like one of the things I'm really grateful for the American educational system because I got to study in Stanford where no one told you don't try to be more special. Uh, don't try to be more special. Like they, be a special snowflake. Be like all you can be and put it all out there. And 
and it was such a life-changing thing for me and, and bringing that energy back to the Finnish educational system I hope also like helps them sort of reassess the way they are uh, building their story but tell about the sure. being better than the others well uh, this is basic to Nordic uh, thinking in general uh, a Norwegian uh, Danish writer Axel Sundemus wrote a novel in 1933 called The Fugitive Crosses His Tracks. And it's about a fictional town in Denmark called Yanta. And Yanta has a law. Don't think you're better than anybody else. Now some people would see this as just horribly aggressive. But there's something quite good about it, okay? Uh, you're not going to have the differentiation that you see here in the United States. Um, you're not going to have uh, the Horace Mann Collegiate Dalton uh, uh, that we have here in New York. It doesn't exist. There are private schools in Finland, but there are 54 that belong to some called the Finnish Independent Association. However, they're funded at the same level as public schools. Um, uh, the uh, teachers have to be certified, the curriculum has to comport with national standards, um, and the teachers get paid uh, according to a national scale. So there's really no out. If you're an investment banker in Helsinki, you really can't escape the system in the same way that you can do so here in New York by sending your kid to Dalton or Horace Mann or Malik or Fieldston. And a big problem, uh, one would say, uh, one could say very convincingly, uh, with American education is that there is this exit. Albert O. Hirschman, a wonderful economist, wrote a great book about this in 1970 called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. And when there's the opportunity for exit, you take your voice with you. So the doctor, the lawyer, the engineer, the banker, she leaves, she takes her countervailing power to make sure that there are science labs and smaller classes and better pay for teachers, okay? And who's left to advocate for the children who are left in the public school system? That doesn't happen in Finland because there's no exit. Now, uh, this is a very important concept. Uh, it's known as Janteloven in Norwegian and Danish, Jantelagen in Swedish, Janten Laki in Finnish, but it's a basic concept. Maybe it goes back to Lutheranism, okay? They were such contemptible corporeal creatures, there's no way you can merit a space in heaven uh, but for God's grace, okay? So don't think you're special. All right, so I think we can go so beyond. So poor Jante, he tries to be special, and then like everything breaks loose, and then he gets like hit by lightning, or like incredible things happen. Right, so the, and, and Lutheranism is the foundation for this part of the world. So we could go beyond Axel Sandemus. It's ingrained in the spirit of the Nordic world. Technically speaking, to get to your question about where does this Finnish education come from, ironically, Sweden, okay? So in 1962, Sweden introduced something called the Grundschule, okay, the comprehensive school. They phased out tracking. It used to be the case that they started tracking in fourth grade in Sweden. They said, we can't do that anymore, okay? It's especially unfair to boys because they grow up later, if they ever grow up, and <laughs> we have to postpone it until eighth grade. So they created this comprehensive school in 1962 in Sweden. Uh, so grades one through seven, everybody would be together. In 1968 in Sweden, they extended it through ninth grade. So the comprehensive school was one through nine, everybody together. Now back in 1962, and a Norwegian historian, Frontier Sjærstad, has written about this, the plan was to reform pedagogical training, teacher training, so that they could teach to a differentiated group of students. Those of you who are teachers know about differentiated instruction. It's a big challenge. If you've got a mixed group, you have to be super talented. Okay, in reaching a, a number of students. <laughs> Finland follows suit 10 years later in 1972. They introduced something called Periscope, okay? And in Finland, like in Germany, they would track after fourth grade. They stopped doing that and they started, and they kept everybody together from grades one through seven after 1972. In 1985, they included uh, grades eight, uh, seven, eight, and nine. I'm sorry, uh, so up through sixth grade. And they, there was a teacher strike. And the teacher struck because it was too much to teach to this mixed group of students without smaller classes. Anybody think of Los Angeles and the teacher strike in January? Okay. And higher teacher pay. They got both. Smaller classes and higher teacher pay. Moreover, 
Sheriff Sped wrote that the Swedes said they were going to reform teacher education in Sweden. They didn't do it. The Finns did. By 1979, the rule in Finland was anybody becoming a primary, lower secondary, or upper secondary teacher, as Linda uh, noted, primary as well as lower secondary and upper secondary, would have to uh, have um, a master's degree. So we had, they consolidated the education. We have eight universities, okay? You've got Helsinki, Turku, Tampere, Uvaskula, uh, Oulu, University of Eastern Finland, and then uh, Lapland, Rovaniemi, okay? And then you have two, uh, some satellite campuses for Turku and Rauma, and for Oulu and Kajani, and also for the Swedish teachers in Vasa, okay? So it all got consolidated. It's research-based. It's a five-year program. The Finns didn't follow through on what the Swedes were supposed to do. And moreover, apropos that strike in 1985, and this is very important, I didn't mention it before in terms of uh, the secret sauce, teacher pay. An upper secondary school teacher in Finland makes 110% of what her college classmate makes. We don't get priced out. In the United States, it's 70%. Okay, Steve, you mentioned before, I was a teacher for 18 years. I always, always had a second job. In, in Sweden, it's 83%. In Norway, it's 70%. You get priced out. So it's a fascinating story in terms of economic necessity as well as nation building, but not a, not a mystery. I did want to follow up, Linda, on something you said, <clears throat> uh, which is, and, and also what Sam has mentioned about tracking. So does not tracking the students lead to some um, suppression of the most talented students? Are they doing less than meeting their full potential? And by the same token, when you have a special needs child or someone who is not keeping up with class, how does the system handle that situation? It's a really interesting question and I would say I don't know and I don't think the Finnish society knows either because the ethos of our country has been so much around the idea that like as a community we thrive and, and not around individualism. And uh, so I started school in 1990, I think, if I, yeah, 1991 or two, and it was the biggest recession we had. So I remember my school career started by like, we would uh, take the erasers and like uh, fold them or like uh, make them into two little erasers and we would have teachers like um, having been, what's the word when they do like have the teacher uh, stay out for a few weeks. Um, I uh, no, 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 when, when you don't have money to pay the teachers, oh. basically, so they, <laughs> they get, anyways, uh, so, so there would be like many different teachers subbing for us and so forth, and then came Nokia, and then the whole economic growth and the idea that like there's this one gigantic company that can like save our whole country, and for a while Nokia was a substantial and huge part of our GDP, and in some ways the whole nation geared towards producing more Nokia engineers and more people who could and would work in the technology field. And again, it was us rallying together as a country. And I think since Nokia kind of dissolved, and, and I think they are coming back, and I think they're doing some excellent and exciting uh, stuff, and there's a very healthy kind of ecosystem around tech companies around uh, right now. But I think the big kind of, question for us as a nation is like where does individualism fit into this narrative that we haven't had in the past. We've had this very strong collective um, narrative but we don't know yet the future and we know that like one supercell company like company like that can generate billions of revenue and it only employs 80 people or so, whereas Nokia employed thousands and thousands of people. So as a country, we need to figure out like what does it mean to support the people who have the capacity to be more. And I would say that I wouldn't be doing the things I do unless I had the experience of being here in the United <coughs> States and kind of seeing that, oh wow, like this is a way of doing things and taking that energy back home to Finland where I feel like I could run laps around everyone else with all of the like, excitement that I got from California. Ahead, well, uh, Steve, in terms of special education, Finland really distinguishes itself here. And um, boys have, uh, in particular, have a hard time with the language. Finnish is a brutally difficult language, okay? Those of you who studied Latin, you know that the final syllable determines the grammatical function of the noun. So you have nominative, vocative, accusative, genitive, dative, ablative. I went to high school in a city, a uh, very Catholic city, so we had a very good Latin program. And uh, so that's six cases. Okay, Finnish has 15 cases, okay, I think there's six locative cases. 
the, um, so the boys themselves have a very hard time with this language, uh, their own language, their mother tongue. And in grades one through three, there is a great deal of attention to helping boys. But uh, something else that's true is there's no grade retention. Okay, they find that stigmatizing. It's uh, counterproductive. So back in 1991, they got rid of grade retention. Also in 1991, because of the recession, ironically, they got rid of the inspectorate, okay? I say that ironically because it was a great development, that it was intrusive and teachers didn't need these inspectors given that they had internalized the expectations. Um, the, so what happens for a student who's struggling is he or she is pulled out for extra help, but not separated, okay? So that's grades one through nine. Okay, now you're going to have then after that, uh, and this is something that we wouldn't be comfortable with in the United States, 50% go to a pre-university high school, okay, the upper secondary program. 45% go to a vocational program. In the United States, it's 8%, okay? And 5% go into the workforce or drop out. And, uh, but what's so, what's so telling about this, and I've spent time in vocational schools um, in Finland, they're, they're incredible. Uh, the, whether it's auto mechanics or culinary arts or cosmetology, um, the, the, the programs are excellent. Here we have a problem with that. We see that as a, a tracking in a negative way. Um, but the problem with tracking is not tracking. The problem with tracking is the economic consequences of tracking. The economic consequences of tracking in the United States are dire. You get a job at Supercuts, okay? You're not gonna, your your salary is going to be dwarfed by that of a doctor, lawyer, or banker. You're not going to have subsidized uh, daycare. You're not going to have any decent health insurance plan. You're not going to have a decent elementary school in your neighborhood. Uh, you're not going to have a pension. You're not going to be able to pay for university for your children. Not one of those six things applies to somebody in Finland who graduates with a vocational degree, with a degree in auto mechanics or culinary arts or cosmetology because her salary is not dwarfed. An orthopedist in Helsinki makes a third of what she makes here, okay? And then you have all these other supports. And we have to concede for sure that a good auto mechanic, uh, a good barber, hairdresser, a good chef, bed, uh, a baker, are critical and, uh, and parts of our society and, and doing noble work, but that's not how we treat people here. So in terms of equality, you do have the law beyond to applying itself to education in that regard there, not here. Linda, you mentioned before your mother talking with your teacher regarding an assessment. Is there a lot of parent involvement at the individual level? I want to know how my child is doing. We have quite a lot of that in our system, as you know. And that's a good, I'm not a parent myself, so I, I, I think not that much. I think we trust our society quite a lot. Uh, and then also the role, like we trust the teachers quite a lot, but of course parents everywhere are worried about their kids and, and want the best for them. Um, I, I thought about something, uh, the vocational school thing, which has been such an imperative for us in Finland that like everyone needs to get educated and the better educated and the higher educated we are, the better we do as a country. So for my parents' generation, they were the first in their families to get a degree. And then for my generation, like, I don't know the percentage of things that get a higher education degree, but it's very, very high because it's been so kind of seen as such a, such a way for, uh, like a strategy for us to thrive as a country. But I think it's really interesting, again, like as this updating of the narrative of, of what we are as a country, is like how are we going to go forward? Because now we have a huge problem with unemployed PhDs who don't find like a job that the society has invested like up to 10 years of education into them and they are not finding their path. Whereas like vocational school, it should be, I, I know it's good, but it should be given a facelift even more. I think there is so many things in vocational schools that we teach that are not going to be replaced by AI or machine learning. These like things that have um, happened for the first time that like have a lot of handicraft in them that like no robot is going to be able to do. And I would be actually worried uh, about the, the students who graduate with a university degree from like journalism or, or media or, or like social sciences, which are all great things, but I think the educational system is 
like graduating them for a world that doesn't exist anymore. And that was kind of like a reaction. I, I think we should tell actually the narrative in Finland about our great vocational system. I was like, okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that our vocational schools are so great. Um, yeah. Is there uh, personalized counseling at the secondary school level where someone talks to the individual about what their choices might be and what their skills, where their skills might take them? I mean, I've certainly met guidance counselors, but you can, uh, Linda can speak to that much more uh, in much more detail. Yeah, my career counselor said that you're smart. You should do like uh, like the AP level math, and I said I don't need AP level math. I'm just going to do like the regular math, and I will study philosophy and art and everything else. And he said, that's not a good choice. You will not get into the, like, the technical university. And I did get into the technical university. And I uh, did get like an honorary doctorate from the University of, of uh, Natural Sciences. I think that is the other beautiful thing about the Finnish system, is that there's very few doors that don't open to you. So there's a lot of movement between the different educational systems. So for, for someone who does vocational school, it doesn't like his or her career doesn't end there, or learning doesn't end there. There's a pathway into university and into even becoming a doctorate, and, and I think that is something that is built into the system. That is not something that the career counselors always recognize, though, so, so I do think there's a lot for us to be made. And frankly, like, who knows what kind of a future? Like, I think the role of a career counselor is so hard, like one of the hardest jobs ever. Those people are amazing in what they do, even if they try. <laughs> And Sam, back to the issue of assessment. So if we don't have um, grades in the early grades, and not as many tests, are there oral reports to students, to their parents? How, how do we assess the children as they're coming up? Or is there just less assessment overall? Well, the assessment's done by the teacher. And again, because the universities are so good in preparing teachers, the teachers internalize the expectations. Uh, in fact, I met one teacher at an elementary school in Uvascula, and I had the national curriculum with me. It was a 320-page book, and I asked her what uh, she thought of this curriculum, and she said, um, well, I've, I've seen that book, but I've never read it. Um, <laughs> so she internalized these expectations. She was an expert teacher. Um, some in the early grades, uh, in some schools there are no grades, but just comments. In some schools they do have grades. It depends. There's a lot of regional autonomy, getting back to that piece by Caroline Rizard, um, and then the develops. Uh, but um, the, the, assessment, uh, the assessment process is, is, in terms of standardized assessment, is, is so much different. What should be noted, however, is there is this North Star for all Finns, okay, who are in grades the equivalent of 10, 11, and 12, and that's a matriculation exam. So that's like a baccalaureate. And you have to take, um, students have to, uh, will, will test in four to seven uh, subjects. So it's Finnish, Swedish, Mathematics, either the long or the short. The long ends with calculus, the short ends with trigonometry. Um, and the, the fourth is either natural sciences or humanities. And then there are a couple different subjects under uh, those uh, umbrellas. Um, so having that baccalaureate type of exam at the end of high school really guides the teachers as well as the students. Um, and as far as our American system is concerned, I think we can go back to 1983 with the A Nation at Risk report under Ronald Reagan that said that our system was falling apart. That led to a lot of states imposing uh, high stakes testing, which ultimately led to No Child, Child Left Behind, signed by George uh, W. Bush in 2002. Um, and for the reasons I stated earlier, it's, it's counterproductive, and the Finns make clear why. Do you think either of you um, <clears throat> uh, that there could be a, one of our states that might impose some of these. I mean, Finland's got the population of approximately Minnesota or Colorado. Could some of this- They also have a lot of Finns. <laughs> they also have a lot of Finns. So, um, might there be a state that could break out with different um, kind of approach more based on the Finnish system? Well, I, I would just say we actually had in North Carolina, a wonderful program. It ran from 1991 to about 2013 before it was killed by a parsimonious Republican legislature. Not that I have any opinion about this. And it was called the North Carolina Teaching Fellows Program. It was a great program. 500 students per year, 
okay, would get a free education at any UNC campus if they committed to teach for five years within the state afterward, okay? It costs the state only $13 million a year by 2011. Michael Weinberg had a great piece about this in the New York Times when the Republican legislature, the Republicans were trying to phase this out. And what they found, for example, in North Carolina is that after year five, in year six, 73% of those uh, former North Carolina teaching fellows were still in the classroom. After year 20, 60% were still in the public schools. Compare that to Teach for America. Teach for America in year six, 7% were left, compared to 73%. So we have, we have some of that. Unfortunately, we couldn't replicate that here in North Carolina. Your idea of Minnesota or a similar state is a great one. And what we could do is uh, suspend these high stakes exams. Uh, we could um, give uh, students uh, a free ride at the University of Minnesota um, and any of the campuses uh, with uh, a 3-2 program like in Finland uh, for preparation. Once you get rid of all that testing, you can include the art, music, crafts, the well-rounded education. Again, they're seamless ways into math and sciences and they make school fun. They attract kids to school. So Bill Gates has spent already $3 billion on trying to make schools better. And the Gates Foundation admitted last year that they uh, accomplished nothing, okay? I, I'd say to Bill Gates, and I'd love to have a conversation with him about this. Uh, uh, Steve Barry just said, Minnesota, let's go to Minnesota. Let's, this won't cost you $3 billion. You can probably do this for a couple hundred million dollars. And you have to be patient. Um, and you'll see, you'll see results. Um, I do want to say one thing, if I can just tack something on to you about this. Uh, because a lot of people can say about the finished results, maybe the reforms implemented in 1972, 79, 85 didn't really do something. Maybe there's something about Finnish culture, okay, and that we're looking at the wrong thing. Uh, and the, uh, we're, we're misidentifying the special sauce. There's an answer to that, okay. Uh, because we don't have any exams from before 2000. Right? Could, someone could say, well, maybe back in 1980, they were half a standard deviation above the Danes, the Swedes, and the Norwegians. Well, the OECD in 2012 started administering another exam. It's called PIAC, P-I-A-A-C, the Program for International Assessment of Adult Competencies. It's an exam given to adults in reading and math, among other subjects, okay? Now, for the age 24 to 34 cohort in 2012, all right, the Finns did much better than their uh, Nordic uh, peers. But if you go to 55 to 64, the Finns underperformed the Danes, the Swedes, the Norwegians, and the Americans. So something happened, okay? This hasn't. I, I, uh, this, this is something that I'm, I'm planning on writing about, okay? But PIAC confirms PISA, which in turn does validate the reforms implemented in 72, 79, 85 in Finland. I would look at this from the perspective of the computer science curriculum. So um, I know a lot of countries around the world are working on this, like how do we teach these 21st century skills, namely coding, namely like, uh, using computers as a tool of self-expression and problem solving rather than only using digital tools to watch videos or whatnot in the classroom. And I say there is one place where I think people are doing things in a very similar manner as Finland. Uh, for instance, in the UK, they started implementing a new discipline called computing uh, roughly three or four years ago, and it's a separate subject. Their school inspection is very well defined. There's a big budget for new teacher training and so forth. Uh, in Estonia, they rolled out computing for all kids. Uh, in Korea, they did the same. It's even part of their like really, really high stakes and stressful SAT scores right now. But there's New York. And in New York, even though you have the outrageously long computer science framework curriculum, I love the statement that is um, done by the mayor's office, I think, originally, that by 2020, New York City will give each child a meaningful computer science experience. 
And I would read that sentence over and over again and like even underline the word meaningful because it's so beautiful and poetic and it gives so much room and autonomy for the teacher to decide what does meaningful mean when it comes to a child. And then there's a lot of reports and, and like uh, outlining of what does meaningful mean. But it's in spirit a very similar curriculum that the Finns uh, did back in 2016 when we did had our like last big core curriculum reform where we stated that coding will be a part of all the different disciplines, not a separate subject like in the UK, uh, but something that is taught in physical education, in maths, in culinary arts, everywhere across the curriculum. And that we give the teachers the autonomy to decide what is the right way to introduce these skills. Um, to the students um, in the right way. So in that sense, I know New York is a very different like state compared to, to Finland, much more diverse, but there are similarities in the way we approach problems, for sure. And inside the Finnish system now, what is the impact of technology? For instance, in some of our schools, every child is given a computer at a certain age, and they teach on that. Would that be common inside the Finnish system? We've definitely had the huge discussion around screen time, around like how much uh, students should be uh, spending time in front of computers, how to get internet to every classroom, and even the matriculation examination uh, is now done on computers, which has been a huge headache for the Ministry of Education. I think uh, the big thing I'm advocating for, and this is not necessarily the perspective of the government, uh, or the educational system is that we should be using computer science as a tool of exploring the world, much like we would use Lego blocks or crayons. Uh, we should use it as, uh, I'm sure some of the people here are very familiar with the or Emilia of the childhood. Uh, pedagogy and methodology that speaks about the 100 languages of the child, how children have 100 ways of expressing themselves, and computer science and technology is one more way of doing that. So you can do very harmful, very distracting, very boring things with screens, and then you can do really expressive, interesting, curious and problem-solving focused things with screens. And I do think that we will figure it out, but we won't figure it out alone. And that's, again, where our international friends are so highly valuable, that we have all of these study groups coming to Finland and basically sharing their best practices on what they've done with technology um, and, and on computer science and, and digital skills. Um, but it won't happen in a vacuum, and I think every country needs to have this discussion. And right now, the discussion is still at the level where it was in the early 90s, which was my generation, where we learned to use the computer, we learned to use the word processor or the spreadsheet, but we didn't really learn to use the computer as a tool for problem solving or self-expression. And I think no country has really figured it out, but we need to do it pretty fast. No, I, I mean, I've seen that they're using more and more computers and uh, in Finnish schools and everywhere. Um, but this is Linda's domain. <laughs> I, I defer to Linda. Let me ask you another question. Um, is there trouble in paradise? And is, has a moment come for the Finnish system that it's beginning to attract critics or it's beginning to hit headwinds? You and I talked briefly about financial constraints because of the current economy. Is there still broad support by the population for the, the educational system? I think it was a surprise for us, for sure, that like we ended up being the best country in the world for, for these things. And we've, we've served that way really well, and we've gotten a lot of sense of self-worth. And, and even to this like, uh, state, uh, state where we feel, I feel at least that we tend to be a little bit too self-congratulatory at times. And I think we are seeing big uh, changes. The last PISA scores were a little bit worrying because boys are being left behind, and I think you will be able to talk a little bit more about that in detail. So we are seeing a system that was built for raising everyone equally up is starting to falter a little bit. Uh, we are seeing more immigration to Finland, which is really necessary and important for our economy. But um, like Sweden and Denmark went through these growing pains already in the 70s. Um, and we are just starting to figure out what does Finland that doesn't have blue eyes and blonde hair look like. And it's a really important discussion, also in terms of education. And then I do feel that there are these big, big global challenges around like what are the skills our kids need and what is the role of education and how much should like private companies be influencing what the education looks like, especially in the realm of technology education where we do have big companies who are offering a lot of their machines and, and um, computers and equipment to the classroom. But 
the role of education is definitely not to only produce more engineers for Nokia or, or other companies, uh, rather it's a bigger discussion to be had of like what is the next hundred years for the Finnish um, growth and, and the national uh, the building of a nation. Well, I, I would say, Steve, that there is concern, um, as Linda said, the PISA scores have dropped. So they, you know, the 2000, 2003, 2006 results, they climbed. 2009, a drop. 2012, a drop. 2015, a drop. I think we can expect 2018 to drop as well. And I think there are two explanations for this, uh, the primary one being financial. Um, uh, Finland suffered uh, from the recession of 2008 tremendously, not just because of the global recession, but because Nokia just got destroyed by Samsung and Apple. Uh, they were too slow to uh, uh, respond to the smartphone challenge and collapsed. Um, though they're coming back now and leading the way in 5G, right? That, that's, the, that's the story I read in the Wall Street Journal. Um, the, uh, but what, what this has meant um, is that a lot of schools are consolidated. Okay, I've spent some time in Kalapti in eastern uh, Helsinki. Uh, that region had eight um, uh, schools uh, until two years ago, and they now have four. And uh, the principal there, Timo Heikinen, was telling me that he is concerned because what was basic to the Finnish model was the small school where the principal knew everybody. But now you've gone from 450 students to 900 students. Okay, I've been in a, I was in a lower secondary school in Riceo, north of Turku, okay? Uh, very large school, okay? Very impersonal. And uh, this is part of the secret sauce, so to speak, keeping schools small. Uh, so, uh, but it's, you don't get economies of scale that way. And uh, to achieve economies of scale under financial duress, they've been consolidating schools. And this is a problem. I would say the other problem, apropos this issue of computers, is that because the Finns have been so comfortable with uh, computers and smartphone technology for a long time, uh, though Nokia was slow to really advance uh, smartphone technology, uh, there's so much comfort with it uh, that students aren't reading as much. Now, this is true around the world, okay? It may be, I'm just speculating, okay? It may be that much more potent a force in Finland. Um, I, I was in uh, Linda's uh, alma mater, as it happens, or lower secondary school a couple of years ago to uh, sit in on some classes and give a talk, Tapiola, part of Espo, uh, just to the west of Helsinki. And at lunch, uh, with a couple of teachers, I observed four students sitting together, all of them looking at their cell phones. Now this can happen anywhere. But the, the scores are not norm-referenced on PISA. They're not norm. Okay, they're absolute scores, so they can come down. Other scores, other countries can go up because perhaps they've, and they have, tailored their curricula to PISA. Okay, Japan did that after the 2006 results. It takes a couple of years uh, to turn a big ship around uh, like this, I mean, in this context. Um, but the, the scores are not normed, uh, and the absolute scores uh, can come down for Finland. I expect they probably will but for financial reasons, but also because of the impact of technology. And the initial mean was 500. The mean has dropped, okay, in all subjects to about a 493. So this is a consequence of, of uh, probably smartphone technology around the world, that you know, kids aren't reading as much. And if you're stopping during a math problem or while reading Shakespeare to check Facebook or Instagram uh, or ESPN, you can't build up that momentum to understand Shakespeare or the math problem. So I, I do see smartphones as dumb phones, or dumbing phones. They're wonderful, but they're also dangerous. And, um, but the, the, the critical concern I think Finland now is, is fiscal. Thank you both. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that over an hour has passed, and we said we would give uh, a chance to the audience to ask any questions they might have. Yes, please. I'm wondering if, um, the, like, what makes, I think you touched on it with uh, Microsoft um, trying to get involved, I think Facebook, if the American model, I'm thinking of the charter schools, uh, the popularity of charter schools in this country, that it's so built on making money, and is that the reason why we're not as well as Finland, because, and how do we change something like that? 
just a question. Okay. So, so the question is, if I understood it correctly, uh, that charter schools in the United States are The driven? education system in the U.S. is so right. driven now by um, capitalism. It's a making money scheme. I, you see, I, that's a, that's a... Like the charter schools. For okay. Example. Now, as far as charter schools are concerned, we have approximately 7,000 charter schools across the United States. Only about 10% are for profit. Okay? It's about 750, just above uh, 10%. Um, some of them, how some there are some bad actors, okay, among charter networks, where people at the top get paid too much money and corners are cut. That's true in conventional school districts too, okay. Um, but I think to get back to Linda's point at the outset, there's a collective vision in Finland that's very hard for us to muster here in the United States. This is just we're we're 320 million people. We're spread across a vast land. We're made up of many tribes, and um, so it's so much harder to, to accomplish what Finland can accomplish. But if we did do what Steve suggested and take a state and try to implement the Finnish plan, yes, I, I think we could do it. I have a cheeky answer to your question. Um, and, and it's around technology culture in general, because, you know, in Finland, if, if, if one of the like top professions is to be a teacher, the other one that is nationally so well looked up on uh, is to be an engineer, because Finnish people are very dependable. They love their problem solvers. We follow the rules. And, and we are an engineering country in many ways. And, and it's interesting to compare kind of the technology culture of the United States and technology culture of Scandinavia and, and Finland in particular, because of the role of open source. And open source is this idea that like computer scientists write code and build on top of each other's code and, and share with one another. And this has been a huge part of the way we built a successful technology, like culture of technology. So Lino Sturwalz, when he was a student in Helsinki University, he created Linux, the operating software that powers all of the smartphones, both the Androids and the the Apple phones nowadays, and he did it for free and shared it with everyone. He also came up with Git, which is a version control system. We have MySQL, which is the database that still powers Facebook today. We have so many different kinds of examples of the way things have built technology that benefits everyone, as opposed to kind of like optimizing for one individual person's or company's wealth. And when you look at the Scandinavian region and a little bit of the Baltic region, it's an unproportionate amount of technology that makes the well better uh, that comes from our region like companies like Skype, Spotify. Um, it's, it's just really interesting that that culture exists and in some way I think it is tied to our culture again the idea that like we do this together and like Scandinavian societies get better by uh, trusting one another and by, by building solutions that benefit the neighbor and, and so forth and I don't know how much that is like in um, influences the, the educational system, but I do think that there is this strong culture around technology that is, is not only for, for optimizing local maximums and, and individual wealth, but kind of benefiting the society at large. And I think that is one of the kind of, hopefully the philosophical guidances that will help us with the, the dumb phones and, and the consumption of, of, of stuff, that the idea that we are a nation that um, builds stuff with technology and builds it for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. More question. Kyle has a microphone. Yes. Um, one, one of the uh, presentation this evening. So just a few pointers on how the, the Finnish uh, education program developed to this uh, amazing standards of, you know, uh, 15 minutes of play, 45 minutes of study. How, did, how does that come about? Who figured that out? Uh, well, th this is... Um, rooted in a, a, a very progressive uh, conception of child development uh, that's uh, across the Nordic world. So you, you'll see, uh, you know, uh, it's not as systematic in Denmark, Norway, or Sweden. Again, they were not under the same uh, economic pressure to develop this unified, strong system. I mean, Norway is Abu Dhabi with snow. Uh, they didn't have to really perform their school system. Um, and that's why they can get away with paying their teachers 70% of uh, what college uh, graduates make. But there, there is a heritage of, uh, of, of, of progressive thinking in terms of child-centered thinking uh, in the Nordic world uh, that's fundamental. 
uh, to uh, school philosophy. And there's a great crafts tradition. Um, Linda, you can speak to that uh, more specifically. Uh, but uh, hands-on uh, crafts culture uh, throughout, and this is basic to what Scandinavia House exhibits, I'm sure, um, on occasion, uh, that influences um, uh, educational curricula. Okay, this, this actually turns out to be a related question. So if there's so much uh, recreation during the day, why does school have to end at two? What do children do after two? Um, are the parents somehow involved in this? And if so, how can they be doing this in an equal level, equal basis, if there are, you know, you know what I'm getting to, the various activities that you pay for. That's, I'll leave it at that. That's an excellent question, and we were just having this discussion back doors. Um, I, uh, so Finland doesn't have the after-school culture you guys have, and that is the one thing I would actually import from the American system. I, I've been to a lot of New York public schools, and, and the school hours can be quite tense because you go through so much, but the amazing thing that happens at the after-school hours, even in public schools you have this amazing coding, like workshops and robotics and dance and, and just the joy and happiness. Uh, that happens. I think it's very likely to the like I like the stuff that we have in Finland do, happening during the school day. But the truth is that even the small kids they leave school at two o'clock, uh, and we don't have sort of municipal uh, or like school um, focused after school programs. It's a long day for them. They wait home, they hang out at the schoolyard, then the parents rush in at five o'clock or six o'clock and take them to their hockey practice or, or ballet classes or so forth, and the family time does get a lot of stress out of that equation. And that is the one thing I would actually like happily bring from the educational system from here, the, the role of after school and, and using the school facilities and, and also offering the teachers more, more work through that. I think what should be noted also, and you're getting with that question to a fundamental aspect of Nordic society, trust, okay? Um, kids, you'll see kids at age six walking to school by themselves. You probably did that yourself, but okay? Um, so it's, it's a latchkey culture in that regard, but there's nothing stigmatizing about that. And the amount of independence allowed children is extraordinary. Now, Transparency International is an organization based in Berlin. They rank countries according to trust in government officials and corporate officials year after year. The Nordic countries are always at the top. And there's this trust that nobody's going to harm your child. And she can go home at two and walk home with some friends and play the piano or, or do an art project, what have you, and mom and dad will be home at 530. Um, but that's, that's something you can't replicate in other cultures because it defines the culture. There's a question in the back. Oh, there. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to add to that comment because I um, lived in Uvascula for six months, two or three, three years ago, um, and I had a uh, seven-year-old and five-year-old at the time. And um, one of the most profound comments my seven-year-old made within the first couple of weeks there was, "Mommy, why do so many kids in Finland?" where are all the mommies and daddies? Like, why don't so many of these kids not have parents? And I was like, no, no, honey, that's called safety. Like, they had, they, she had noticed so many kids walking without parents, which is something she never saw um, in the US. And then I remember being at a first grade classroom and the day ended, and the teacher was just like, bye guys, see you tomorrow. And I'm like, wait a minute, you don't walk to the door and make eye contact with every parent or make sure every kid is getting on the right school bus. And she was like, what are you talking about? Um, but that, just the, and the one other example is I came to pick up my kid one day after school and I was like, oh, what'd you do today? And she's like, oh, we went to the library. I'm like, oh, there's a library in your school. She's like, no, the public library, a mile away. And they had taken this field trip with no permission slips, no, you know, and none of that. And it was just this idea of safety in Finland and rule following and trust until you're there, like you really don't believe it. And then you're there and you're like, oh wow, it's so different parenting there. But it's really interesting because I don't recognize it at all. Like I, when I go to Japan, I admire that in Tokyo you have seven-year-olds like walking around the city and, and just like going about their day in a million-person city. And I don't recognize the same thing that is happening in my own home country. And that's why, again, you need the perspective for mothers to, to see that in effect. So thank you. 
Um, I think I'm here. Hello. I'm in the back. Here. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, please. I wanted to give you a, a, a very out of the press anecdote to kind of validate everything you've said up here. So uh, I work with teenage boys. Um, I have a business called Catch Up Boys, and I help usually products of divorce. I help boys catch up. And I was just meeting with this client of mine who's had a lot of trouble in school and been in and out. And um, he's thinking of dropping out again. And I asked him to envision a school that he would look forward to going to each day. And he described your school. Like everything you thought appeared to a T, which is amazing to come here after that experience and hear that there's a country where my client can go and because he loves learning, he loves school. Here's my question. Well, other than wanting a school like to finish school, we, we've had him at a neuropsych and he has executive functioning issues and I work with kids who have ADHD and ADD and perfectionism, anxiety, you know, insomnia, um, various learning challenges. And I haven't heard you mention, other than special education once or twice, I haven't heard you mention learning challenges in, in Finland at all. And I'm wondering if it's a chicken and the egg. They're going to a school they look forward to each day. I wonder if it cuts down on that, or you just haven't brought it up yet in your speech. So I'd, I'd love for you to address that. Specifically to boys, if possible, but it doesn't matter. Thank Samuel, you. you might have the better data about this. I, I must say that I'm privileged in the sense that I just don't know, because my own school years were a long time ago, and uh, special ed did happen, but like in my classroom there was one girl who didn't speak Finnish as a native like language, so it's a very very different Finland that I grew up in, and I, I would I think you would have a better idea of special ed. Okay, well you've raised an excellent question, and I imagine uh, there is information about number of students diagnosed with ADHD, for example, in Finland. Um, they're very good at record keeping. Uh, Finns are famous for that. But my gut says, because there's 15 minutes of play for every 45 minutes of study, and if you have a double period, which they often do for labs, which are themselves engaging, and the teacher talks for five minutes, okay, then you have an 85 minute lab, then you have 30 minutes for recess. You can even put on your ice skates, okay? They have rinks at a lot of these schools, outdoor rinks. You don't develop ADHD, okay? We have a unrealistic expectation of children in this country, okay? Uh, and and we, we love to play, and we need to play. Intellectual activity is a form of play. Um, and we don't allow our students to do that. And I have to believe, without having done any research into this area, that ADHD is very much a product of a terribly constructed school day. Thanks. Did we have other questions? Yeah. Kyle, it's hard for me to say. So. Great. Um, thank you. I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is um, about, uh, so I'm a teacher, and I work with a lot of English language learners. I work in Queens. And, um, and the idea of having um, a teacher autonomy and um, having uh, no standardized tests, I mean, it's appealing for, for every teacher. I mean, every teacher that I you know, work with loves that idea, but especially working with English language learners, you want to be able to custom tailor or you know, differentiate as much as you can. Um, so I guess my question around that is how, how do we, how do we convince policymakers that that's really the way to go? And then um, the other, the other, um, I guess, question or comment was more that um, I do remember hearing Pasi Salberg speak at Teachers College years ago, and one of the things that always stayed with me from his talk was when he said, you know, where did this come? From? Where did ideas come from? He said we didn't reinvent the wheel. We actually took a lot of ideas that came out of U.S. research, and. And it really, as a teacher, it kind of stung to hear that, that all this wonderful research is being done here, and it's not really being applied in public education settings. But it is being applied in the Finland um, public schools. So I guess if you could um, maybe comment on that, but also the, the first question about how do we convince policymakers uh, regarding more autonomy, 
um, you know, giving more trust in teachers, you know, getting, you know, getting rid of some of the standardized tests. Thank you. Maybe I can take the latter question. Um, I think that is one of the perks of being from a small country, from a country of five million people. There's no way that, for instance, in computer science, like curriculum, there would be people who would be world class in thinking, and that means absolutely that I need to go outside of Finland to find the experts and learn from them and be really, really hungry for that knowledge. And I think the best Finnish teachers do that. And sometimes it's really sad to see that, like, it's not a natural thing for a San Francisco teacher to think that, oh, I could reach someone in London who's working on the same topic or in, I don't know, like, in uh, Belo Horizonte and I do feel like Finland by virtue of being a small country forces pretty early on us to think in a global manner and that's why we are like learning from everyone and trying to implement from everyone because we just don't have the brain power to do it ourselves whereas you as a large country can sometimes be a little bit like self-centered in a good way. Um. Posse is a close friend of mine. I, I think I introduced Posse at that talk at Teachers College that you're referring to. Um, and afterward, I showed him the, uh, I think it was Jacob Epstein's bust of John Dewey at Teachers College. And he said, ah, Dewey, basic to finish education. Yeah. So you've nailed something. You've identified something very important. And you've, in the process, identified another problem. And we're comparing public education to public education. The fact of the matter is we have great private schools across the United States that don't inflict this pain on their students. Now, No Child Left Behind, all this high stakes testing was done in the name of the most noble democratic ideals to close the achievement gap between privileged and underprivileged children. But all we've accomplished is repeated documentation of the chasm between privileged and underprivileged, and in the process, of course, crowded out time for art, music, crafts, and play, and made school a very distasteful experience. In terms of uh, convincing, uh, so, you know, Dewey is obviously very basic to great progressive public private schools across this country where they don't have to give these terrible tests. Um, as far as influencing uh, uh, policymakers, there's the, I think the pendulum is swinging back. And I mean, Diane Ravitch has been fighting this battle every day um, with her blog. Uh, and Posse has had an influence here. Um, and, and many others uh, have tried uh, to, to make this argument. I think uh, there's movement against it, and um, I, I'm hoping uh, that we can get there, that we can get back to where we were in the 70s. Not that that's some paradise lost. It wasn't perfect. Uh, but the school day was certainly uh, far more appealing for both teachers and students. We can take one more question. Kyle? Is there anything special about teacher training uh, at the universities there? There's quite a lot that's special. Um, again, it's three years content, two years pedagogical theory and practice, but part of the training that astounded me was that if you're becoming a teacher of, um, uh, say, biology or math, you have to take a phys ed class, okay? You have to take a crafts class. You have to imagine what it's like to be a student again. So you can appreciate phys ed. You can appreciate crafts uh, through a mature set of eyes and comprehend what it is that the student's supposed to be um, gaining on this class outside. There's something else as well, though, uh, in, in pedagogy that's, that's, that's quite impressive about their preparation. Uh, they have lab schools everywhere. Okay, you went to yes. right? Okay, so you can talk about that, Ms. Uh, Linda. But for the uh, seventh through ninth, okay, in science, your science teacher is also your math teacher. Okay, so you're certified in science as well as math in seventh through ninth grade. That means that you can structure your classes in an integrated fashion. Math, after all, is the language of science. Okay, we, we, we don't get that here in, in many schools. That's what math is, it's the language of science. And if you have a teacher who's trained in both science and math, then she's going to be able to make it that much more powerful. And that probably goes also a long way in explaining Finland's distinction in science. Now, as far as the lab school is concerned, Linda has personal experience with it. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned math is the language of science because coding is what makes math alive and brings it to, like, makes it visible and, and understandable. And that's, that's why we're also, 
putting a lot of effort into them, uh, both like the ongoing professional development for teachers, but then also the teacher training university. So the lab school I went to, every um, it was my high school. There's for one for every uh, stages in Helsinki, and uh, every three semesters, uh, which were like four or five weeks long, we would get like a full, full four or five week um, course. Uh, run by a teacher training student and the real uh, teacher would observe at the end of the classroom and give feedback and also we students were asked for to give feedback for this uh, teacher trainer and it was a mandatory part of their uh, studies and interestingly enough this sounds like a subpar education that you get this like rookie teachers who come in and disturb the everyday life of the schools but that was not the case the high school i went to was one of the hardest high schools the top three high schools to get into in helsinki so being able to like help new teachers become better and get the newest ideas for the university was actually seen as a perk for the students and also the uh, parents uh, so the lab schools are very like fought after and, and hard to get into well, that concludes our program. I, I hope uh, all of you enjoyed it. Appreciate it.